Hi, good morning. I'm Pastor David with Declaration Church, and this is the first time we'll be posting a message online. Uh, normally, in, on a Sunday morning, we'd be gathering together in one place and, and hanging out and learning together, uh, talking together, having discussion, and today, uh, things are a little different. Uh, it's been a long week. We just started last week a series uh, all about who we are in Jesus, and We've been going through our values, really digging deep into our values as a church over the first part of this year. Uh, as a church, Declaration Church, if you'd like to know more about who we are, we have some videos posted on our YouTube channel that tell you about who we are as a church, but uh, our values are identity, relationship, and purpose. And we're really digging deep into those this year, really trying to understand what those are, what they mean, what the implications are for our daily lives. And so we started the year going through the identity of God. Who is God as expressed in Jesus? And we explored that through the gospel according to John and the seven I am statements that Jesus makes. And uh, we just started a series called Who Am I? Really digging into our identity as people. Now, who we are is very important. And we often confuse who we are with what we do or what other people think about us, certain characteristics or activities that we have, and we lose, we really don't understand a lot of times who we really are. And so we're going to be digging into who we are according to what the Bible says about us, according to what Jesus says about us, what the apostles wrote about who we are in Christ, and really exploring our own identity, really trying to learn how we can discover who we are as people of God and as individuals, how to explore that piece. And so today we're going to be actually looking at first or I'm sorry, second Corinthians, second Corinthians chapter five. So if you have your Bible with you or you want to uh, grab your Bible app on your phone or your tablet, go ahead and do that. Go ahead and get to second Corinthians chapter five. And as you do that, uh, you know, I usually would be up and walking around and, and talking at the same time. I usually like to move. I'm a very, uh, very active kind of talker. I don't like to sit in one place. But today, with things being what they are and the microphone being fixed, it's important that I do it just here right like this. I'm, so I'm just going to have a conversation with you sitting here on my couch. And so go ahead and turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And while you do that, I want to tell you about a passion of mine, something I absolutely love, I get excited about, and that is technology, electronic devices, and I'm really a huge fan of refurbished electronic devices, and I'll tell you why. You can get a lot of great tech for a much lower price, and you know that the quality is generally going to be very good. I had great luck with refurbished devices because somebody has already had the device from brand new and something has gone wrong and they returned it and they got a different one and they've gone through it with a fine tooth comb. They've really looked through it and explored what's going on and they've cleaned it up and they've replaced all the components that needed replaced and then they've shipped it back out. Uh, the latest thing we got was actually a new uh, refurbished iPhone for my son. His other phone uh, finally just kind of broke out after a couple of years, finally died, the, wouldn't charge anymore. And so we got him a replacement. Uh, we don't like to get uh, the brand new and we don't like to go on the plans and do the payment thing. So we just go and we buy a refurbished phone for, we pay cash and, and we get it, we add it to our phone and replace one of the others and we add it to our plan and everything's great. Uh, refurbished sometimes I think is the way we think of ourselves in Christ. We like to think of ourselves in Christ as kind of a, a dirty sinner that's broken and, and he just kind of takes us and he, he washes us up and he kind of dusts us off and he makes sure that some of those broken components are working and he just kind of shoves us back out there. And that's not really the picture that the Bible paints. Uh, the Bible is a lot more specific about who we are in Christ and what it means to be a new creation. And that's what we're going to be exploring today is what it means that we are new creations in Christ. And so, uh, you know, maybe maybe you've always kind of thought of yourself as, as just that kind of dusted off, used uh, product in, in Christ. Maybe you've never really thought of yourself as brand new, uh, more of a renewed in a way. And, and I want to share with you what the Bible has to say in 2 Corinthians about who we are in Christ as a new creation and what that means. And so as we take a look at this particular passage, 
Let's see what we can learn about who we are in Christ through 2 Corinthians chapter 5, starting in verse 11. Paul is writing to the church in Corinth. This is the second letter of his that we have to the church in Corinth. And he says in verse 11, therefore, which means that what's in, what's coming here is based on, attached to, what he's just finished saying. And so he's talked about our place here on the earth and how our bodies are, he calls them tents, are, are really just temporary dwellings for who we really are. They break down, they get old, they start to wear out. And as they wear out, we really groan for something new, something better, something eternal. And so with that in mind, with that understanding of what's going on with us and how our physical bodies aren't really who we are, they're just where who we are is living, it's kind of the dwelling place, a temporary dwelling place for who we are in Christ. With that in mind, last verse, verse 10 says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. And so what we do in the body matters. And it's really the idea of who we are being in the body isn't being the full expression of who we are in Christ, that there's something more there. There's an eternal peace to us as humankind. Uh, And in fact, in uh, Ecclesiastes, Solomon says uh, something very similar. He says that eternity has been placed in the hearts of man. And so we all have kind of a longing for eternal life, for this eternal existence. And so with all of that in mind, Paul says this, therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, Knowing that right respect, that awe for God. We persuade, we being Paul and his companions, we persuade others. But what we are is known to God, and I hope it is known also to your conscience. We are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you cause to boast about us. So he's saying, you know, we're not, we're not trying to establish our credentials with you again. We're not trying to give you reason to believe what we have to say because he, he's like, you already know us. We know you. You know us. We've spent time with you. We have a relationship. We know each other. So he's not trying to introduce himself and, and give them reason to believe him again. No, what he's doing, it says, we're not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you cause to boast about us so that you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearance and not about what is in the heart, which then creates this idea Then it's implied that that's not Paul and his companions. Paul and his companions, the people who are writing this letter, who are are communicating with the church in Corinth, and maybe even some of the members of the church in Corinth, these, these people are not boasting about their outward appearance. No, where they find their boast is in Christ, where they find the things that, that are important, where they will speak about their strengths and talents is somewhere within and not something you can observe just from looking at the surface. Uh, verse 13, for if we are beside ourselves, if we're crazy, if we've lost our minds, it is for God. So you say, if we're, if we're completely crazy, it's all for God's benefit. It's because we're serving him. And if we are in our right mind, so if we're not, if we're completely logical and thinking through this with strong reason and understanding, it is for you. And really what he's saying is no matter what it is, whether we're crazy or not, whether we're in our right mind and able to reason or we are absolutely lost our mind, we are doing it with the right motives. And it's for your benefit and for the benefit of God and his kingdom. Verse 14, for the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this. That one has died for all, and therefore all have died. And he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. And Paul very rarely mentions the death of Christ without mentioning the resurrection. Because there is power in the resurrection that really makes the death of Christ evident as to what the purpose of his death was all about. His death was about us gaining eternal life, that our 
punishment for our sins, our mistakes, our our rebellion, really, against what God's best is for us, those things are wiped out in Christ so that we now stand before him pure and holy. And, And that's kind of part of the new creation piece, but it's not the whole thing. Now, I know there's a lot of verbal gymnastics there with, you know, love of Christ controls us. The one who died, died, all died, and and all of these things. Basically, what he's saying is that because of Christ's sacrificial death, it is the penalty for our sins, our rebellion, is death. And so since he's paid for that, then it is reckoned unto us that we are no longer responsible as we're in Christ for all of those things. The penalty of death has been paid for us. And so in that way, we've all died. Even though we're still breathing, we're still living, we're still walking, we're still talking, or at least I am because I'm you know, a long-winded preacher, right? So all of these things have been taken care of. The penalty has been paid for our sins. And so we no longer have to experience that penalty because of the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then verse 16. From now on, therefore, because of the death of Christ, because of his resurrection, because of that sacrifice, from now on, as we are in Christ, therefore we regard no one according to the flesh. So we're no longer going to be looking at people and and just looking at people on the surface, looking at people at face value. Now we're going to be looking deeper. We're going to be looking into the heart. We're going to be looking for God in them, which is much, much farther below the surface. It's not about their face and their their hair and their eyes and their, their clothes and their status. No, we're looking deeper. We're looking past those things and looking for God's image in the people around us. We no longer look at them the way that we always have in the past, the physical things that we've seen, the outward appearance that we're also used to looking at. No, we don't regard people in that way anymore. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we even looked at Jesus this way once. We even looked at Jesus in the same way and evaluated him in the same way that we evaluate most people. Uh, That's why he was rejected by so many people is on the surface, he really wasn't attractive. He really didn't look all that great. He really wasn't something that people desired. And that's something that Isaiah talks about. But uh, we regard him thus no longer. Meaning we no longer look at Christ that way. We have seen the truth of who Jesus is, and now we regard him differently. We see past the surface and into the truth of who he is as the Son of God, the King of Kings, our sacrificial Lamb, to provide us with salvation and a renewal, a a brand new place in the family of God. Verse 17, therefore, because of all these things, because of what we just discovered, if anyone is in Christ, anyone, not just you, not just me, not just the guy down the street, not just the people who go to church every Sunday, everyone, if they're in Christ, if anyone is in Christ, He is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And that's where we're going to stop reading today as we continue to learn about who we are in Christ. And so with all of that in mind, now that we've studied through this, you know, verse 17 is extremely popular. It's one of those things that you'll hear in a lot of different church settings in Bible studies. You'll hear from Christians walking up and down the street. They'll walk into a hospital room and they'll say, you know, you're a new creation. You're a new creation. Uh, so you can't, you know, this, you can't be sick and these kinds of things. And, and it's really taking the verse out of context. That's not really what Paul is writing about. But It can be easily misunderstood and misapplied if we don't really pay attention to the context of what Paul is saying. And so I want to explore, with that understanding of the context and what we've just read, what we can learn about being new creations. What can we learn about who we are as new creations from this text keeping in mind all of the things we just discovered about 2 Corinthians chapter 5. What can we learn about ourselves as new new creations? The first thing I notice that we can learn about ourselves as new creations is this. Who we are 
isn't necessarily apparent on the surface. You know, Paul talks about our bodies being tense and us groaning for that eternal dwelling where we're going to live forever, that our bodies really are temporary. Tents aren't necessarily buildings that we expect to house things and people long term, especially in our society here today. You don't use a tent to sleep in, generally speaking, all the time, because you know that that tent is going to be weathered and it's going to wear out and it's not going to stand the test of time. You want something that's going to really protect you against the elements. It's going to give you that added that added sense of security and comfort that you can't really get in a tent, especially like here where, where I live in Nebraska. Right now we've got snow on the ground. I wouldn't want to be outside in a tent with the snow on the ground. That's not comfortable. It's difficult. I mean, you have to get special tents to be in those kinds of conditions. You can't just take our summer family tent that we use to go camping outside right now and sleep in that. It's going to get wet and it's going to soak through the floor and it's going to really be uncomfortable because that wind is actually going to cut through the outside and it's not going to, you're not going to be able to stay warm in there. It's going to be really difficult to be comfortable inside that tent. In the same way, our bodies, as we get older, they start to break down. We start to discover these aches and pains. You know, like I have a finger here, this little finger that's really kind of bent and ugly and crooked because I dislocated it. When I was working out one time, I dislocated it and you know, and forever until, you know, this body is completely gone and I'm in my eternal home, it's going to be bent like that. It's, it's wearing out. It has, it, it's not going to last forever. And we all know that. We see that every single day. And so who we are isn't this. And it's not apparent on the surface. Who we are isn't apparent on the surface. What we are, who we are in Christ as new creations is known to God. God knows exactly who we are. He's created us to be who we are. So he knows exactly who we are. He knows every detail, even way better than we do even. And so he is going to know that with certainty. He knows who we are. And hopefully as we spend time with him, as we spend time in silence and and prayer and listening to what God is saying about who we are, as we explore our identity with him in Jesus, we'll begin to understand that as well, internally. We'll begin to see ourselves for who we really are, not just what we look like on the outside. It's way easier to just go look in the mirror and say, yep, I look good today, things are great, and move on and say, that's who I am. But that's not who we are. It's just the shell. It's just the outer piece that covers who we really are in Christ. It's just our representation here on the earth. It's not our identity. But what we can know is that who we really are is revealed in our conduct. It's revealed in the way that we act. It's evident in how we behave. Go ahead and look at verse 13 real quick. It says, for if we are beside ourselves, you know, if we've lost our mind, Paul says, if we completely lost our minds, it's for God. So people look at what Paul is doing, and honestly, what Paul is doing, what he's done to this point, people could look at Paul and say, Paul is insane. In fact, in Acts, we find a place where Paul has been arrested. He's imprisoned in Caesarea. And he's asked to come and present to the governor and to uh, a King Agrippa. And he stands up and he presents the gospel. He shares about his life and why he is where he is. The false accusations of the Jewish religious authorities. And in fact, Governor Festus at that point says, Paul, your great learning, all your studying has made you mad. You're insane. You've lost your mind. And what Paul is saying here is, you know, If that's true, it's all for God. It's all for Him. It's all for His purposes. It's actually serving His purposes if I've actually lost my mind. It's evident in His behavior that He's following Christ. His true identity is being revealed in the way that He's behaving. And some people might look at that and say, this guy's insane. And yet other people might look at him and say, no, 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 that makes so much sense. 
I see what he's doing. I see why he's doing it. I totally understand. And Paul says, if that's the case, if you see who I am and you think that makes total sense and it brings you closer to God, then me being in my right mind is all for you. If what I'm saying makes sense to you, if you're following my logic, then all of that is for your benefit so that you can get to know Jesus, so that you can follow him more closely. Our true identity is not revealed in the way we look. It's revealed, it's revealed in the way that we act. It's revealed in the things that we do. So who we are isn't apparent on the surface. It's not something we can see with our physical eyes. The second thing that I notice is who we are is controlled by entirely new motivations. Entirely new motivations. You know, we used to be controlled by our own desires, our, uh, our own wants, our own, uh, and, and the world's desires for us. You know, so many times, you know, what we do and the choices we make is controlled by what other people want and what other people think. I can think back to high school before I finally, before I just started hating people. You know, this is a part of that process. You know, that's changed a lot since I've come to Christ. But w- before I met Jesus, when I was in high school, I just wanted people to like me. I wanted to find out where I would fit. And so in order to gain friendships, in order to fit in and find a niche, I would do things that really I didn't necessarily want to do. I didn't think were a part of who I was or anything that I was really necessarily good at, but I wanted to be a part of a group. And that was something that I, I, I thought, well, if I'm going to be a part of this group, then I have to do this. I have to behave this way. I have to dress this way. I have to do these things. This is what I have to do to be a part of this group. And those are the kinds of things that have motivated us in the past before we come to Christ. There are also those things that I have just really wanted, those internal desires. And they're not necessarily godly, godly desires. They're not necessarily good desires. They're not things that come from God or reflect who God is but they come from within me. They're my selfish desires, those things that I want. You know, other part, uh, another part of the scripture says the lust of the eyes and the, you know, all these things. That I, I look at things and I think, you know what, I really want that. One of those, an example of that is a few years after I had gotten married and I was going, I was working, I was doing all of these things, going to school to become a pastor. I was going to Bible college. I was going through all of these different classes. I was working at a TV shop and I started thinking, you know what? I'd really like to build a computer. And I didn't talk to my wife about it. I just started secretly buying components to build a computer. That wasn't right. That wasn't good, but it was motivated by my own selfish internal desires. And those are the kinds of things that used to direct us. But now we're controlled by the love of Jesus. Look at verse 14. It says, for the love of Christ controls us. So the motivation for our actions, the way that we live, the way that we behave in the world, shouldn't be all of that other stuff that used to motivate our choices. Now we should be controlled by, our choices should be motivated by the love of Jesus. The love of Jesus for us and the love of Jesus for those around us. Those are the things that should be motivating us now. In Christ, who we really are is motivated by the love of Christ. Because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, and therefore all have died. He died for all. Because of the love of Christ, because of the love we see in him, the sacrificial life and death and resurrection of Jesus, that love now motivates and controls our actions, the true self. That's what drives us now, not the other things that used to control us. We're no longer living for ourselves. We're no longer living for the world's approval. Now, there's a struggle there. You know, Paul writes about that in Romans. But, you know, there are times where it's like, why did I do that? And, you know, because we gave in to our own selfish desires again. That, that dies hard. You know, that's why Jesus said we have to pick up our cross daily is because he knows that every day we're going to have to make decisions that reflect our desire to walk with him, to reflect him, to live in the new self, and not to live the way we used to live. We have to put this, we have to 
hammer the old self and our old way of living to the cross every day. And it's not as easy as even it may sound. It's not even as easy as it is to say. It's far from that. It's difficult, but it's the, it's the way that we are supposed to live. And as we live out our true selves in Christ, that is reflected in our motivations and the things and the actions that we take. Now we're living for Jesus, the one who died for us. We're no longer living for ourselves. We're no longer living for our own selfish desires. We're not just going out and eating and drinking for tomorrow we die. Not anymore. No, we used to live that way, baby. But now, now we're living for Jesus and we're trying to show him to the rest of the world in the choices that we make. So who we are isn't apparent on the surface. And who we are is controlled by an entirely new motivation, the love of Christ. And the third thing, the last thing I want to talk about that I noticed is that we are something that has never been seen before in the world since the Great Rebellion. Now, a lot of, uh, I use the term the Great Rebellion in place of the fall because the fall just sounds like an accident, doesn't it? Just sounds like something you kind of stumbled into. Maybe you tripped and oops, oh, I fell. No, it's not that. That's When we talk about what happened in Genesis chapter 3, when humanity, humanity is no longer living the way we're supposed to live. When we make a choice to, that is contrary to what God has told us to do, that's rebellion. That's us choosing to say, no, God, I know better than you do. And I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm going to choose my way. That's rebellion against God. And so I, I, I'd call it the Great Rebellion. So since that point of human history, which who knows how long it was before that happened, but since then, what we are, who we are in Christ has never been seen. And it's reflected in that phrase. You look at verse 17. Paul says, with all of these things being considered, therefore, if anyone is in Christ... If you have a relationship with Jesus, if you're walking with him, if you've surrendered yourself to him, if you've placed your faith, your trust in him, if you are in Christ, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. That phrase, new creation, in the Greek means something that the world has never seen before. It's something that has not previously existed as we know it. So this is something that's brand new. It's not a refurbished product. You're not something that Jesus comes in and he wipes you clean and he sends you back out there. No, you are brand new. You're not refurbished. You're not renewed. You are brand new. You're something different. You're something altogether separate from what you were before you met Jesus, before you made that commitment to him. It's a brand new life, brand new existence. That is something we have to grasp because we get so tied up in our pasts that it can be an anchor on us to realize that we are something brand new in Christ, that our old motivations and our old mistakes, our rebellion, our old hurts, all those things are now part of our past. They're part of something else. They're not a part of who we are in Christ. They might influence choices. They might be a testimony for us to benefit God. God takes all of that stuff and he uses it. But who we are is something brand new. Jesus talks about it in John chapter 3 as being born again, which is a great understanding of this. It's not about taking the old person and sticking them back in the womb so they can be delivered again and born again as an adult. It doesn't really work that way. And that's the problem that Nicodemus had when Jesus said it. Jesus said, you must be born again, 
And he's like, what are you talking about? How's it even possible? How does a man get back in his mother's womb so he can be born again? It's not possible. And that's exactly right. It's not possible for us to be physically born again. We have to be spiritually reborn which means that we start as a spiritual infant. That's why so many, of the, uh, so many of the writers of the New Testament talk about spiritual milk is because we have to start on something we can actually digest so that we can grow and become strong so we can get to the point where we can really start to consume the meat of the scripture and the meat of a relationship with Jesus and, and what he has to say. It's a maturing process involved in our life. From the point we surrender to Jesus to the point we leave this earth, we are maturing and growing in Christ. That's the way it's supposed to work. It requires that maturation process. In fact, in Ephesians chapter 4, I'm going to go ahead and turn there. Ephesians chapter 4, starting in verse 22. It's another letter from Paul to a church in Ephesus Uh, This one to Ephesus, not to Corinthian, to the church in Corinth, obviously two different churches. But he writes this. He says, put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. We already kind of talked about all that. You know, our old way of living and our making choices based on our own benefit and receiving acceptance from the world and gaining things from the world. He says, put all that stuff off because it belongs to your former manner of life. It's corrupt. And to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. See, there's a process there. There's a stripping of the old and then a putting on of the new through the renewal of your mind, beginning to gain a new understanding, a new way of thinking that's available only in Christ. So with all of that, understanding that who we are is someone completely different than before we came to Christ, that it's not apparent on the outside. It's not something you can just see by looking at ourselves in the mirror. It's not something that others can see just by looking at us with some passing glance and then Uh, We're no longer being controlled by the former things, the things that used to drive our decisions. And we're not any longer just this thing that is so common and, and normal in the world, but we're something completely brand new and different, constantly being revealed in new ways to the world as we mature from spiritual infancy after our rebirth to spiritual adulthood. You know, it's easy for us to not think about those things because we do see ourselves in the mirror and, you know, our physical appearance before we come to Christ and after we surrender to him really doesn't change at all. You know, when I surrendered to Jesus, I didn't walk out of that room and look physically different. You know, my, my hair didn't change. My eye color was the same. I didn't grow or shrink I didn't lose weight or gain weight. Nothing physically changed about me because I surrendered to Jesus. However, it should be evident in how we live, the way I'm living now, the person I am, the choices I make now, all of that should be different than it was before. The new creation that I am in Christ should be evident in the way that I act, in the way that I behave, and in the choices that I make. Being controlled by the love of Jesus instead of all the other things that motivated me in the past. That's what should, that should be the way that we live. We shouldn't be motivated by those old things that used to drive our decisions anymore. We should be completely and totally surrendered to the love of Christ. And that's what should be motivating our decisions now. This is especially true because we're now that brand new creation. We're something the world's never seen before. While we have not fully seen the results of this new creation, we haven't, you know, don't just surrender to Jesus and ta-da, everything is different. 
And the world's like, holy mackerel, we've never seen anything like that before. Who is this? It's not like that. Okay, it, does, it is a process, a maturation process. Who we are in Christ is fully alive within us from that very first moment. Who we are in Christ as a new creation is right there from the very first moment of our surrender. And he becomes, that, that individual, that new person, becomes more evident to those around us every single day as we follow Jesus. And that's what we should be looking for. That's what should be, that should be our heart's desire, is that each and every day, as we walk with Jesus, as we get to know him better, as we get to see who we are in him more clearly, that that would be revealed to those around us every single day, more, just every single day, more and more and more in ever increasing measure, they should be able to see who we are in Christ above and beyond all the rest of those things. The people who knew us before we met Jesus, they should see us now and begin to see changes taking place. They should see us as a new person. That's what happened with me. I came to Christ and I I started living differently. I started making different choices. My, my choices were motivated by something completely different than they were in the past. Now being motivated by the love of Christ, everything started to change. So much so that my parents, I was off at university in uh, Lincoln, Nebraska. My parents were living in Denver, Colorado, about eight hours away from me, eight, nine hour drive. And they called and then they came to check on me. They actually made the drive to come and check on me because they were they noticed so so many changes, such a difference just in our conversations over the phone and in the choices I was making. They they saw such a difference that they made the special trip out there just to make sure I hadn't completely lost my mind and joined some kind of crazy cult. What they saw was me becoming a new creation, me, the new creation within me being revealed to them. And that's what should be happening every single day in our lives as people see us. They should be seeing the new self more and more and the old self less and less. That's what I want. That's what I want in my own life. I want people to look at me every day and begin to see my reflection of Jesus and who I really am, the true self. I want people to see God in me more clearly every single day because of the way that Jesus is growing me and maturing me. And that's what I want, not just for me, but for all of you. I hope that's what you want as well. So let's pray. God, we thank you so much for who you are. Jesus, for your sacrifice and your love that now motivates us as your people, as your followers, to live this brand new life that you've given us as brand new creations, something the world's never seen before that you've placed within us, that now you are bringing out and revealing as we grow in you. God, I pray that you would reveal that to the world around me, to the world around all of us through the choices that we make through the way that we live, that your love would motivate those decisions that we make every day, that those choices would no longer be based out of all of the other things in our past that used to drive our decisions, but that now all of our decisions would be driven by your love for us and for the rest of humanity, for all of creation, that those, your great love would be what motivates our decisions going forward. And that through those decisions, through those choices, motivated by your love, the world would get a true picture of who you are as we live out your plan for us. As we live out who we really are, the new creation in Christ, that people would see you more clearly in our lives, and that would influence them to surrender to you. We pray this knowing that you've allowed us to come into your presence in the name of your Son. We ask that this would be done according to your will. Amen. Thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, There are going to be some discussion groups. I hope that you'll continue 
in our time together through those discussion groups and share with one another how God's idea, this truth of being a new creation is impacting the way you live today and the way you hope it impacts your life going forward. As always, I'm Pastor David, and I'm out.